Hi everyone, just checking in again. Um, I hope you're doing all right at home and kind of weathering the days as they go by. Um, but I'm glad you came back for a little inspiration, some poetry and our continued reading of Tuesdays with Maury. So let's get right to it. So here's our poem for today. This is one of my all time favorites. It's called Gift and it's by a poet named Szeslaw Milosz. And um, he was a Polish poet, although he lived for many years in California as well. Um, but he and he wrote uh, many poems. He was very prolific. But this is just a short one by him that was always one of my favorites. And it's called Gift. A day so happy. Fog lifted early. I worked in the garden. Hummingbirds were stopping over honeysuckle flowers. There was no thing on earth I wanted to possess. I knew no one worth my envying him. Whatever evil I had suffered, I forgot. To think that once I was the same man did not embarrass me. In my body, I felt no pain. When straightening up, I saw the blue sea and sails. So I think this is just such a beautiful little poem. First, obviously for the imagery that's in there, the fog and the garden and the hummingbirds and the honeysuckle flowers, and you can hear the alliteration in there too. Um, but also what it's about. So it's this day that's so happy and he's in nature, he's in the garden, he's with the hummingbirds and with the honeysuckle flowers. Um, but also the, the next few lines after that are, are just really extraordinary in there in what they're saying. So he says there was nothing he wanted to possess, which of course, isn't that a gift, that feeling, because normally we're running around trying to get more and more things and just sort of accumulate things to make ourselves feel safe and secure. Um, but he's talking about that feeling of not having that. Then he says, I knew no one worth my envying him, which again, normally or, or in other moments, we have these intense feelings of jealousy for other people or wishing we were more than we were or that we had accomplished more things. Um, and here in this moment, the poet says, I knew no one worth my envying him. Then he says, what ev whatever evil I had suffered, I forgot. So meaning whatever past wrongs he had gone through, he wasn't remembering them, which again, just think of how much time we spend remembering how we've been wronged and being angry at the people that did it. Then he says, to think that once I was the same man did not embarrass me. And this line I love because that reminds me of just how much time we spend remembering things that we're ashamed of and things that we're embarrassed of and how much that consumes us in some moments. But here he's saying in this moment to think that once he was the person that did something did not embarrass him. And then he says, in my body, I felt no pain. And that speaks for itself. So What's amazing about this is he's having this moment of not being plagued by all the normal sorts of things that plague us. But then what's extraordinary, uh, extraordinary about this poem is that it's called gift. So this moment is a gift. So he's acknowledging that kind of normally we are plagued by all these feelings of doubt and anger and jealousy and insecurity and craving. Um, but here he's kind of free of it in this moment, which is so wonderful. Um, and I think it's something that we have access to all the time. You know, any moment can be a gift where you just kind of get into that space of you don't want anything and you're not jealous of anyone and you're not angry about past wrongs and you're not ashamed of yourself. And, um, Especially now, I feel like with all of this kind of time on our hands, we can try to get to that space. And I think being in nature is a real part of that, where you're just really quiet and centered and just being yourself is enough. Um, but then the last line is, is, is something as well. He says, 
when straightening up, I saw the blue sea and sails. Another nice image, um, but also an indication of time passing. If you think of sails on the ocean, they're moving and the sea is always moving. So that last line kind of shows that time keeps going on and even this moment of a gift will pass and maybe he'll be back into some of those negative emotions. But I think it also means that you can get yourself back into the positive emotions. It's kind of what I was saying earlier in the week about the flow of life and you just kind of go with it. But if you can get to those moments that are a true gift where you're just kind of alone with yourself and, and you feel even one of these feelings, that's something to be grateful for. So that's a little bit of um, poetry for today. That's Gift by Sheslav Milos, and you can um, look that up anytime. It's, it's, it's on the internet, and uh, it's really just a beautiful poem. So let's go to Tuesdays with Maury. So here we are back with Tuesdays with Maury. And before I start reading, I'll just point out that obviously this page, if you're looking at the screen, it's in italics and that's signifying a shift in time. So hopefully you've noticed that he's been jumping back and forth in time um, from when he was in college and he knew Maury to the present moment where he's working and he's rekindled this relationship with Maury. Um, but where we're gonna start today is on an italicized page. Um, so even if you're not looking at the screen, hopefully you, you can hear it in the, in the setting and things like that, that we're jumping around in time. In the campus bookstore, I shop for the items on Maury's reading list. I purchase books that I never knew existed, titles such as Youth, Identity and Crisis, I and Thou, The Divided Self. Before college, I did not know the study of human relations could be considered scholarly. Until I met Maury, I did not believe it. But his passion for books is real and contagious. We begin to talk seriously sometimes after class when the room has emptied. He asks me questions about my life, then quotes lines from Eric Fromm, Martin Buber, Eric Erickson, Often he defers to their words, footnoting his own advice, even though he obviously thought the same things himself. It is at these times that I realize he is indeed a professor, not an uncle. One afternoon, I am complaining about the confusion of my age, what is expected of me versus what I want for myself. Have I told you about the tension of opposites, he says? tension of opposites. Life is a series of pulls back and forth. You want to do one thing, but you are bound to do something else. Something hurts you, yet you know it shouldn't. You take certain things for granted, even when you know you should never take anything for granted. A tension of opposites, like a pull on a rubber band, and most of us live somewhere in the middle. Sounds like a wrestling match, I say. A wrestling match, he laughs. Yes, you could describe life that way. So which side wins, I ask. Which side wins? He smiles at me, the crinkled eyes, the crooked teeth. Love wins. Love always wins. Taking attendance. I flew to London a few weeks later. I was covering Wimbledon, the world's premier tennis competition, and one of the few events I go to where the crowd never boos and no one is drunk in the parking lot. England was warm and cloudy, and each morning I walked the tree-lined streets near the tennis courts, passing teenagers queued up for leftover tickets and vendors selling strawberries and cream. Outside the gate, was a newsstand that sold a half dozen colorful British tabloids featuring photos of topless women, paparazzi pictures of the royal family, horoscopes, sports, lottery contests, and a wee bit of actual news. Their top headline of the day was written on a small chalkboard that leaned against the latest stack of papers and usually read something like, Diana in row with Charles, or Gaza to team, give me millions. 
People scooped up these tabloids, devoured their gossip, and on previous trips to England, I had always done the same. But now, for some reason, I found myself thinking about Maury whenever I read anything silly or mindless. I kept picturing him there, in the house with the Japanese maple and the hardwood floors, counting his breath, squeezing out every moment with his loved ones, while I spent so many hours on things that meant absolutely nothing to me personally. Movie stars, supermodels, the latest noise out of Princess Di or Madonna or J.F. Kennedy Jr. In a strange way, I envied the quality of Maury's time even as I lamented its diminishing supply. Why did we bother with all the distractions we did? Back home, the O.J. Simpson trial was in full swing, and there were people who surrendered their entire lunch hours watching it, then taped the rest so they could watch more at night. They didn't know O.J. Simpson. They didn't know anyone involved in the case. Yet they gave up days and weeks of their lives, addicted to someone else's drama. I remembered what Maury said during our visit. The culture we have does not make people feel good about themselves, and you have to be strong enough to say if the culture doesn't work, don't buy it. Maury, true to these words, had developed his own culture long before he got sick. Discussion groups, walks with friends, dancing to his music in the Harvard Square Church, he started a project called Greenhouse, where poor people could receive mental health services. He read books to find new ideas for his classes, visited with colleagues, kept up with old students, wrote letters to distant friends. He took more time eating and looking at nature and wasted no time in front of the TV of sitcoms or movies of the week. He had created a cocoon of human activities, conversation, interaction, affection, and it filled his life like an overflowing soup bowl. I had also developed my own culture, work. I did four or five media jobs in England, juggling them like a clown. I spent eight hours a day on a computer, feeding my stories back to the States. Then I did TV pieces, traveling with a crew throughout parts of London. I also phoned in radio reports every morning and afternoon. This was not an abnormal load. Over the years, I had taken labor as my companion and had moved everything else to the side. In Wimbledon, I ate meals at my little wooden work cubicle and then thought nothing of it. On one particularly crazy day, A crush of reporters had tried to chase down Andre Agassi and his famous girlfriend, Brooke Shields, and I had gotten knocked over by a British photographer who barely muttered sorry before sweeping past, his huge metal lenses strapped around his neck. I thought of something else Maury had told me. So many people walk around with a meaningless life. They seem half asleep even when they're busy doing things they think are important. This is because they're chasing the wrong things. The way you get meaning into your life is to devote yourself to loving others, devote yourself to your community around you, and devote yourself to creating something that gives you purpose and meaning. I knew he was right. Not that I did anything about it. At the end of the tournament and the countless cups of coffee I drank to get through it, I closed my computer, cleaned out my cubicle, and went back to the apartment to pack. It was late. The TV was nothing but fuzz. I flew to Detroit, arrived late in the afternoon, dragged myself home, and went to sleep. I awoke to a jolting piece of news. The unions at my newspaper had gone on strike. The place was shut down. There were picketers at the front entrance and marchers chanting up and down the street. As a member of the union, I had no choice. I was suddenly, and for the first time in my life, out of a job, out of a paycheck, and pitted against my employers. 
Union leaders called my home and warned me against any contact with my former editors, many of whom were my friends, telling me to hang up if they tried to call and plead their case. We're going to fight until we win, the union leaders swore, sounding like soldiers. I felt confused and depressed. Although the TV and radio work were nice supplements, the newspaper had been my lifeline, my oxygen. When I saw stories in print each morning, I knew that, in at least one way, I was alive. Now it was gone, and the strike continued. The first day, the second day, the third day. There were worried phone calls and rumors that this could go on for months. Everything I had known was upside down. There were sporting events each night that I would have gone to cover. Instead, I stayed home, watched them on TV. I had grown used to thinking readers somehow needed my column. I was stunned at how easily things went on without me. After a week of this, I picked up the phone and dialed Maury's number. Connie brought him to the phone. You're coming to visit me, he said, less a question than a statement. Well, could I? How about Tuesday? Tuesday would be good, I said. Tuesday would be fine. In my sophomore year, I take two more of his courses. We go beyond the classroom, meeting now and then just to talk. I have never done this before with an adult who was not a relative, yet I feel comfortable doing it with Maury, and he seems comfortable making the time. Where shall we visit today, he asks cheerily when I enter his office. In the spring, we sit under a tree outside the sociology building, and in the winter, we sit by his desk, me in my gray sweatshirts and Adidas sneakers, Maury in Rockport shoes and corduroy pants. Each time we talk, he listens to me ramble. Then he tries to pass on some sort of life lesson. He warns me that money is not the most important thing, contrary to the popular view on campus. He tells me I need to be fully human. He speaks of the alienation of youth and the need for connectedness with the society around me. Some of these things I understand, some I do not. It makes no difference. The discussions give me an excuse to talk to him. Fatherly conversations I cannot have with my own father, who would like me to be a lawyer. Maury hates lawyers. What do you want to do when you get out of college, he asks. I want to be a musician, I say, piano player. Wonderful, he says, but that's a hard life. Yeah, a lot of sharks. That's what I hear. Still, he says, if you really want it, then you'll make your dream happen. I want to hug him, to thank him for saying that, but I am not that open. I only nod instead. I'll let you, I bet you play piano with a lot of pep, he says. I laugh. Pep? He laughs back. Pep, what's the matter? They don't say that anymore? The first Tuesday. We talk about the world. Connie opened the door and let me in. Maury was in his wheelchair by the kitchen table, wearing a loose cotton shirt and even looser black sweatpants. They were loose because his legs had atrophied beyond normal clothing size. You could get two hands around his thighs and have your fingers touch. Had he been able to stand, he'd have made no more than five feet tall and he'd probably have fit into a sixth grader's jeans. I got you something, I announced, holding up a brown paper bag. I had stopped on my way from the airport at a nearby supermarket and purchased some turkey, potato salad, macaroni salad, and bagels. I knew there was plenty of food at the house, but I wanted to contribute something. I was so powerless to help Maury otherwise, and I remembered his fondness for eating. Ah, so much food, he sang. Well, now you have to eat it with me. We sat at the kitchen table, surrounded by wicker chairs. 
This time, without the need to make up 16 years of information, we slid quickly into, into the familiar waters of our old college dialogue, Maury asking questions, listening to my replies, stopping like a chef to sprinkle in something I'd forgotten or hadn't realized. He asked about the newspaper strike, and to, true to form, he couldn't understand why both sides didn't simply communicate with each other and solve their problems. I told him not everyone was as smart as he was. Occasionally, he had to stop to use the bathroom, a process that took some time. Connie would wheel him to the toilet, then lift him from the chair and support him as he urinated into the beaker. Each time he came back, he looked tired. Do you remember when I told Ted Koppel that pretty soon someone was going to have to wipe my ass, he said? I laughed. You don't forget a moment like that. Well, I think that day is coming. That one bothers me. Why? Because it's the ultimate sign of dependency, someone wiping your bottom. But I'm working on it. I'm trying to enjoy the process. Enjoy it? Yes. After all, I get to be a baby one more time. That's a unique way of looking at it. Well, I have to look at life uniquely now. Let's face it, I can't go shopping, I can't take care of the bank accounts, I can't take out the garbage, but I can sit here with my dwindling days and look at what I think is important in life. I have both the time and the reason to do that. So, I said in a reflexively cynical response, I guess the key to finding the meaning of life is to stop taking out the garbage? He laughed, and I was relieved that he did. As Connie took the plates away, I noticed a stack of newspapers that had obviously been read before I got there. You bother keeping up with the news? I asked. Yes, Maury said. Do you think that's strange? Do you think because I'm dying I shouldn't care what happens in this world? Maybe, he sighed. Maybe you're right. Maybe I shouldn't care. After all, I won't be around to see how it all turns out. But it's hard to explain, Mitch. Now that I'm suffering, I feel closer to people who suffer than I ever did before. The other night on TV, I saw people in Bosnia running across the street, getting fired upon, killed, innocent victims, and I just started to cry. I feel their anguish as if it were my own. I don't know any of these people, but how can I put this? I'm almost drawn to them. His eyes got moist, and I tried to change the subject, but he dabbed his face and waved me off. I cry all the time now, he said. Never mind. Amazing, I thought. I worked in the news business. I covered stories where people died. I interviewed grieving family members. I even attended the funerals. I never cried. Maury, for the suffering of people half a world away, was weeping. Is this what comes at the end, I wondered? Maybe death is the great equalizer, the one big thing that can finally make strangers shed a tear for one another. Maury honked loudly into the tissue. This is okay with you, isn't it, men crying? Sure, I said too quickly. He grinned. Ah, Mitch, I'm going to loosen you up. One day, I'm going to show you that it's okay to cry. Yeah, yeah, I said. Yeah, yeah, he said. We laughed because he used to say the same thing nearly 20 years earlier, mostly on Tuesdays. In fact, Tuesday had always been our day together. Most of my courses with Maury were on Tuesday. He had office hours on Tuesdays. And when I wrote my senior thesis, which was pretty much Maury's suggestion right from the start, it was on Tuesdays that we sat together by his desk or in the cafeteria or on the steps of Pearlman Hall going over the work. So it seemed only fitting that we were back together on a Tuesday here in the house with the Japanese maple out front. As I readied to go, I mentioned this to Maury. We're Tuesday people, he said. Tuesday people, I repeated. Maury smiled. Mitch, you asked about caring for people I don't even know, but I can tell you the thing I'm learning most with this disease. 
What's that? The most important thing in life is to learn how to give out love and to let it come in. His voice dropped to a whisper. Let it come in. We think we don't deserve love. We think if we let it in, we'll become too soft. But a wise man named Levine said it right. He said, love is the only rational act. He repeated it carefully, pausing for effect. Love is the only rational act. I nodded like a good student, and he exhaled weakly. I leaned over to give him a hug, and then, although it is not really like me, I kissed him on the cheek. I felt his weakened hands on my arms, the thin stubble of his whiskers brushing my face. So you'll come back next Tuesday, he whispered. That's a good place for us to stop for today. All right, so have a good day, everybody. Read other books, get some rest, go out into nature, and um, we'll be back again tomorrow. Have a great day, you guys. Bye.